Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog, and this is episode 200. Thank you guys for sticking with me all these episodes, for rooting me on, for getting us to this point. I really do appreciate it. And for today's episode, we're going to do a little bit of a longer discussion, although I am talking about smaller stories. So it may still be around the same length as other videos uh, that we do discussions on, so maybe 20, 30 minutes. So if you're here for that, thank you so much for being here. We have more movie news coming up very soon. we got Comic-Con coming up, and I have a special surprise for you guys, which I'll talk about at the end of this video for some other videos that will be coming up very soon. But on today's episode, we are actually going to talk about two stories. We're going to do a double creature feature. And I'm going to talk about two moments in Eddie Brock's history that are very pivotal to this time period that we've been talking about lately. So we've talked about the Daniel Way run, where they try to clone a piece of the symbiote and try to return Venom strictly back to his venomous evil roots. Uh, but that didn't really work. Uh, you know, for the most part, a lot of people missed Eddie Brock. So when they brought Eddie Brock back in, they were like, we want more of him. We got the Venom vs. Carnage miniseries. They introduced Toxin. We had all that going on. And then we had the reveal that Eddie Brock had cancer in Spectacular Spider man from Paul Jenkins and Humberto Ramos, which we talked about in our last discussion video. And now we are at the final turning point here. This is going to be essentially what I would say is the end of Act 2, in a way, of Eddie Brock's life. Um, so he's had a, a, a very crazy road, started off pretty much like a villain, and they always plan to maybe take the symbiote away from Eddie Brock and put it on other villains, Spider-Man villains especially, like the Scorpion and, uh, and Dr. Octopus, which both ended up happening. And we will definitely talk about all that stuff in our next you know, round of discussion videos that we have coming up after this. Uh, but for here, we're going to talk about the final days or what I thought might have been the final days of Eddie Brock. And we're going to see maybe a little bit of redemption in this character, someone who really did try to do the right thing numerous times and just kept failing miserably at it. So, uh, so that's what we're going to get into today. And the first story we're going to talk about in our double creature feature is going to be the Marvel Knights Spider-Man story. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole book. It's 12 issues long. It's written by Mark Millar, and he had a bunch of different artists on it, mostly Terry Dodson and Frank Cho. And this was kind of Mark Millar's version of Batman Hush. He even coined the phrase that it was called Spider-Man Shush around the office. And ultimately, I really don't care for this story at all. Um, it's pretty much just a pretty cookie cutter story. I think Mark Miller does it a lot. If he's not ripping himself off in his own ideas, he's ripping other people off in some form or fashion, or just trying to, you know, ha make a comment on other people's writing in a way. And it sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. I know some people do like this story. For me, overall, I didn't. There is some interesting elements in it. For the most part, it's about Aunt May and she gets taken. She's kidnapped by one of Spider-Man's villains, but he doesn't know who. So the whole time he's trying to figure out who could be the villain that would kidnap Aunt May. And uh, it goes around. It's, you know, there's vultures involved, uh, the owls involved, Norman Osborn, of course, involved. And it ends with a big battle against Spider-Man and the Sinister 12, because apparently six isn't enough anymore to fight Spider-Man. So there's a few things in this story that are kind of interesting but the main thing is is there's some venom stuff in here that is very interesting and that is what we're going to sink our teeth into today which is volume two of the marvel knight spider-man story and this is called venomous and it recollects issues five through eight which came out in 2004 to 2005 uh, if i'm not mistaken so after the spectacular spider-man story where you know we found out that eddie brock had cancer we haven't seen Eddie Brock anymore in the comics around this time until this story popped up. And what happens in here is that, you know, after Aunt May's been kidnapped and Peter Parker's working on all of that, a bunch of villains, you know, teamed up to start beating him up. I think it was Vulture and Electro. And so the Sinister Six started to form together. And then, of course, like I said later on, they become the Sinister Twelve. And, uh, and in this story, we have Peter uh, basically finding out he's bankrupt. Him and Mary Jane are bankrupt. They have no money. They can't pay the ransom for Aunt May. They can't go public with it because that would give out Peter's secret identity. So there's a lot of things that they're trying to do behind the scenes. Meanwhile, J. Jonah Jameson and the Daily Bugle put like a $25 million reward on Spider-Man and said if anyone can find out his true identity, that they would get this money uh, that was, uh, you know, I guess donated to them or something or came to them for, through various, you know, channels. And so J. Jonah Jameson is really out for blood right now to find out who Spider-Man is. So Peter Parker is dealing with all that. And on top of that, we get this new introduction of a new Venom, essentially. So Eddie Brock has now come to New York after being away for a while, maybe making, you know, his, you know, saying his last goodbyes to his dad or who knows where he was. But he's flying into New York and he's coming back to auction off the Venom suit. He basically made a deal with the Venom suit and said, look, I'm dying. This cancer thing is, is hurting us. It's hurting both of us. You want to get away from me. I want to go and just, 
you know, face the music. I want to go die like I've always wanted to do before I met you. I want to go kill myself if that's what it takes. Uh, and so I can't take this bonding anymore. And obviously you can't either. You're in a lot of pain. So let me do one last thing to make, do some good out of this. I will auction you off to a villain or whoever can, you know, raise the most money. Maybe some rich guy is not a bad person, just wants, you know, the suit or whatever. But whoever can raise the most money and donate the most money at this auction, I will hand you over to them. They'll be your new person that you can attach to. And uh, and again, it doesn't really touch on the continuity of, you know, the suit needing, you know, a, a epinephrine or a certain kind of, you know, chemical that bodies are producing, adrenaline or nothing like that. They don't go into all those details. The suit in this story is just a thing that I guess Eddie Brock can sell off and is not going to care so much. So it's, you know, Mark Miller, again, not really, I think, knowing what he wanted to do with the character. I think he just had a cool idea and he didn't care what kind of continuity was established before. He just wanted to do this story and tell his story his way. But whether I like it or not, it is kind of an interesting concept in my mind. And so Eddie Brock goes and he auctions off the suit and his plan is to take whatever money is raised and donate it to charity so that he would essentially force these bad people to do something good in a way. And he also didn't want to go out on a scummy note. He's kind of really regretted all the stuff he's done over his lifetime, especially with the suit. And now he just wants to punch his ticket and clock out. He knows the cancer is going to eat away at him the second the suit leaves his body. So obviously he's prepared for that. And he, he's prepared for a very painful death. And he thinks he probably even deserves it on some level. So he goes to this auction where the shocker is, where the scorpion is, you know, the owl, all these villains and everything are auctioning to try to buy this suit. And we never actually see what happens at the auction. All we see is like a full issue later, we find out who won. And there's like this Don, this criminal guy that, you know, runs part of New York uh, named Mr. Fort Fortunato. And uh, and his son is kind of like a wimpy kid. You know, he's like an old school mob boss and he wants like a manly son, I guess. And his son has always been picked on. He's always been teased. He's kind of like, you know, he's 5'9 and he weighs like 90 pounds. He's like a skinny little, you know, goofy kid. And he wants to make his way into the crime world and he's un uh, unsuccessful at it because of the way he looks and then because of the way he acts and everything. So, you know, his dad, the powerful crime boss is like, all right, I'm going to pay a hundred million dollars for this suit. And we're going to put, you know, the suit on my son and he will now become the new venom and maybe he'll man up. And then, you know, and also Angelo's like, you know, uh, you know, kind of showing that he's maybe not into this. So Eddie Brock's like, Hey, look, you know, I took the money. I spent it. I divided over 50 charities. A lot of good's going to come out of this. If you don't want the suit, that's fine. You know, this, it's the, the business is kind of done anyway. And Angelo is like, you know what? I've had a crummy life. I've always been picked on. I've always lost every fight I've ever been in. You know, I, I want to prove myself. And I think I just need this. I think this is an opportunity that came down from above. Maybe, you know, you know that, that would uh, help my situation out. And I think Eddie probably responded a little bit to that. Cause I think that's how Eddie felt about the suit at first when it showed up at a church, no less probably thought it was some kind of sign up from above that wasn't a curse but it ended up being one and so I think he's like all right I guess we did kind of serendipitously find the right person even though uh, that person really just won it because they had the most money so he hands over the suit to Angelo and Angelo becomes the next Venom and then what we find out is that Angelo asks Eddie Brock hey does this suit know who Peter Parker is because there's that big reward out there um, for Peter Parker's secret identity so if I could learn it maybe we could get some of that money back that my dad's paying you and, uh, and then also at the same time, I can, you know, earn my stripes as a man and maybe go kill Spider-Man when he's least suspecting it. So Eddie Brock's like, yeah, if you're nice to the suit kid, maybe it will tell you who Peter Parker, you know, <laughs> who Spider-Man is. He didn't say Peter Parker. He's like, maybe it'll tell you who Spider-Man is. So Angelo dons the suit, finds out who Peter Parker is, that it's Spider-Man is Peter Parker. And then he goes and attacks Peter Parker at his high school reunion and actually kills a couple people at the event uh, to get to Spider-Man or to get to Peter Parker. And then Peter slips away, puts on the Spider-Man costume and the two duke it out. And at first Spider-Man is actually losing because the suit is very vicious. It's trying to kill him. The suit kind of is like, yeah, finally, after all these years, we can actually kill Spider-Man. After what he did to me last time, he tricked me into bonding with Eddie Brock. I, you know, I have more hatred for him now than ever. And I'll, I'll put up with this like little whiny kid that I'm attached to right now uh, because it's gonna lead me to possibly killing Spider-Man. So the suit kind of has something to benefit from this, at least, you know, in Mark Millar's eyes, anyway, as a writer of this story. 
And what happens is at the end of this is that Peter Parker once again rises and beats the living crap out of Angelo, aka the new Venom, and just beats him to a pulp and and to the point where the suit is like, look, you're you're being too afraid, you're not focused. Like Eddie Brock used to focus and use his rage to power us both because we're in a symbiotic relationship. And Eddie even describes bonding with the suit, what it's like, which I really liked. He said when you first bond with it, it's hard to breathe because then it has to learn how to share your lungs and all this other stuff. And he said, so it's a really painful process. Process. And it was cool to see a little bit of that in there, which I was like, oh, that's pretty good. That's where Mark Millar, I think his strengths lie is little details like that sometimes. So I appreciated some of the elements in this and seeing Angela lose though, the suit gets frustrated with him and says, no, you're, you're as weak you know, at the start of this as Eddie Brock was at the end of it. And he's like, I don't want to go from one weakling to another. I need someone better than this. He goes, so I'm, you know, like I'm piecing out. So the suit jumps off the ledge with Angelo and then separates from Angelo and drops Angelo to the ground. And Spider-Man does try to save him, but he's unsuccessful. And Angelo hits that pavement hard and uh, and dies on impact, and the suit slithers away. And Peter's looking down at the streets, and he sees that Angelo's father is showing up to the crime scene where his son's body is, and they're putting a tarp over him. And he can see that Angelo's father is a little, you know, content, actually. He's like, hey, my son actually died like a man. And, uh, and then after that, Peter goes off and he has to deal with, you know, what happened to Aunt May. He goes into the whole adventure of the last four issues of the series, which we're not going to talk about, really, because we're more or less here for the Venom stuff. So where does this story leave Eddie Brock? That is the big question, because we know Spider-Man. I already said at the beginning of the video, he goes off, he fights a Sinister 12. There's a new Venom that happens, you know, in the next arc. Uh, so, you know, the suit finds a new host. We're going to talk about all of that in future discussion episodes for sure but right now for this double creature feature we're going to focus on Eddie Brock and at the end of this after finding out that the suit bonded with Angelo and killed innocent people at Peter Parker's high school reunion Eddie realizes oh I've I've done a horrible thing I, I took that money and I donated to charities sure that was a good thing but I've unleashed the suit into New York and it is killing innocent people and he feels directly responsible for that and because of that he doesn't want to wait for the cancer to kill him he decides to take his own life and at the end of this book it's pretty brutal Eddie Brock goes to 53rd and Broadway and he takes a blade and cuts both of his wrists and leans against the wall and waits for himself to bleed out but luckily that is not where Eddie Brock's journey ends. I thought it was when this book first came out in 2004, 2005 area, uh, I was scared. I was like, oh my God, that's the end of Eddie Brock. He killed himself and it happened in one panel. And you know, what what happens? Like, what, you know, what are we gonna see next? Uh, we have, that can't be the end of Eddie Brock's story. And luckily it wasn't. A couple years later in 2007, they do a story called Spider-Man Back in Black. And luckily a very talented writer who a lot of you know today, who's writing and producing shows like River Dale and Sabrina and he did the Carrie remake and he did a lot of the Stan stuff uh, the Stephen King Stan stuff that Marvel released uh, the comic book version uh, his name is Roberto Aguirre Sacasa he's a very talented writer I love the guy to death I had the pleasure of meeting him numerous times when I worked at Golden Apple Comics and he came along and gave Eddie Brock one last chance for redemption and for the second half of this double creature feature, we have The Last Temptation of Eddie Brock. And that again is written by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, and it's drawn by Lee Weeks and a number of other artists. I think Clayton Crane comes in in the second issue to do some stuff. So there's a couple different artists on these two issues, but it's pretty consistent, it looks really good, and it takes place during a storyline called Spider-Man Back in Black. So after Civil War, when Peter Parker revealed his secret identity to all of New York, he decided to change sides and not no longer fight alongside Iron Man, and he joined Captain America's side. And then that kind of went, you know, <laughs> not well for him, as things normally don't go well for Peter Parker. And so he decides to go back into his black costume and try to change the persona and perception of Spider-Man. And uh, this especially doesn't go well because what happens is Aunt May, after his identity is revealed, she gets shot by a sniper. And Peter Parker obviously feels responsible because he was unable to keep his his family safe. They were safe in Stark Tower when he signed up with Tony Stark and Tony was like I'll put protective agents on you know Mary Jane and your Aunt May and then once Peter turned his back on Tony uh, those agents went away and they had to like slum it and they were going to little seedy hotels you know trying to stay alive and unfortunately with his identity out there some sniper found him and shot at him and he dodged it with his spider sense and saved Mary Jane but the bullet hit Aunt May and hospitalized her, putting her in a coma. So that's kind of where we are when this story starts, is that Aunt May's in this hospital, Mary Jane's watching over, and Peter is going out at night 
trying to you know find the sniper trying to find people responsible and also you know he's a little bit more edgy uh, as spider-man he's a little bit angry at the world i guess and uh, and he's you know trying to deal with it the way he can but he's running around in the black suit and so that's where basically the setup for the story is so in these final issues of back in black as the series was nearing an end Luckily, Roberto came along and said, you know, I have a great idea for a story for Eddie Brock and uh, give him one last chance to prove that maybe he's not the monster that a lot of people think he is and maybe paint him, even if it's the last story written by, uh, you know, of him, that we make sure that he goes out on a good note uh, if we can, uh, or maybe just save him and his soul in general. And that's what he does in the story, and I think he does it really well. This is one of my favorite Eddie Brock stories because it purely is an Eddie Brock story, and there's not a lot of those. Uh, and in this, we get a lot of flashbacks of Eddie Brock's life. We get a lot of things that we haven't learned before, and what I love about this, which is, you know, big with me from writers, is when you can add something to someone's continuity without really retconning anything. And that's what I really liked about this, is that uh, Roberto did a great job balancing a lot of things, touching on Eddie Brock's life, showing the, the history that he's been on, the path he's been on, and that it's never been the path he's always wanted. And he keeps deviating from the path he thinks he should be on. And I think like anyone who has bad luck, you know, consistently in their life, or just gets a lot thrown at them in life, I think Eddie Brock realizes that deep down he actually is a good person and he's just lost his way. And that is the crux of this story and why I like it so much. So with the setup out of the way, let's talk about issue 38 and 39 of Sensational Spider-Man where Eddie Brock starts to remember at the beginning of the story, you find out he's alive. And at first when I opened up the book, I was like, holy crap, he's alive. Eddie Brock's alive. This is great. Uh, so that immediately made me feel good about, you know, what happened in the Mark Millar stuff. I was like, oh good, he wasn't just dismissed. And, you know, no, you know and there was a writer out there that didn't forget about him. And that's what made me really gravitate to this instantly. That is that seeing Eddie Brock walking down the hospital, you know, hallway, you know, hooked up with an IV. And he's, you know, he's got his, you know, wrist wounds and stuff. His, his wrists are bandaged up and he's you know walking through and he's kind of talking things out to himself and he's remembering parts of his life and one of the things he remembers at the beginning of this is when he was 22 years old and he was going to school for journalism that J. Jonah Jameson himself actually was giving a lecture at a school and said something that really resonated really well with Eddie Brock and it was talking about truth and it was talking about what kind of person you're going to be and ultimately what kind of person you are is what defines you as a journalist and what kind of approach you're going to take to journalism and he goes into this big detail about you know looking for the right thing looking for the right detail telling the right story uh, but also you know making sure you get as close to the truth as possible. I guess this was at a time when J. Jonah Jameson had a lot more integrity uh, and he wasn't just like kind of a, you know, a yelling slime ball at times. Uh, but these words impacted Eddie Brock and he forgot those words. And again, this is a book that shows that he has deviated from his path. And so when he was thinking about that, he's like, you know, you know, J. Jonah Jameson said this great speech at my school. And then after that, I was interning at the Daily Globe. And then before I knew it, I got caught up in the, you know, the whole story with the Sin Eater. And then my life just completely went off track and I decided not to abide by the, the the speech that J. Jonah Jameson gave and I decided to deviate from the path and look where it's led me. It's led me to a suicide attempt, to an alien symbiote, to a battles with Spider-Man, uh, to another you know attempt at suicide, to selling off the suit, uh, more innocent people dying which are now on me and you see Eddie Brock really reflecting on his life and reflecting on his sins in particular and even though he's still faulting Peter Parker which is great, I like that Roberto did this because that was something Paul Jenkins did in his run in Spectacular Spider-Man when uh, when him and Peter were talking and Peter was like, you know, why do you blame me for everything? You're such an obvious crook and bad guy like Brock. You never take responsibility for what you've done. And so here again, we have it. We have, you know, Eddie looking back at all these moments in his life and he's blaming Peter for most of them. Uh, even ones that Peter couldn't possibly be responsible for, but he's still doing it. And you see that there's still that chink in his armor that's still that weakness that he can't overcome he can't be aware of of his own bad he just knows that there is bad uh, but he's not aware of his involvement with it and that's ultimately where this story takes eddie is that it leads him to a place where he finally takes responsibility for the things he's done
most of these two issues is just Eddie Brock talking to himself. But what happens is the other voice that he's talking to starts to materialize into the alien costume. And it actually claims to Eddie, it says, you know, I'm still inside you. Even though you sold the suit, there's still traces of me in your DNA. And what's cool about that is that is actually something that will help set up a story later on in a couple more years when Dan Slott takes over the Spider-Man books. So I thought that was really, really cool that they uh, had you know, that little nuggets in here. And that's something that I think Dan Slott picked up and ran with. So that's what the suit is claiming. Although in this story, we don't know. We don't get a definitive answer if there is traces in Eddie's blood, even though the nurse there is taking a lot of, you know, a lot of blood from Eddie. She's coming in daily to do blood tests on him. So, you know, we're not even sure if she's on the level, if she's, you know, what's going on, or if they just like, you know, her higher ups are like, hey, go get more blood from that guy because the cancer should have killed him by now. It's been a couple months since the event, you know, where we found him with his wrist cut and uh, he's, you know, still tried to take his life a few other times, but uh, he's he's in a bad place, but something's unique about him. He's not dead yet, and we don't know why. And so there might be some truth to the claims, but at the same time, they still play it ambiguously. Like, Roberto does a great job playing it to where you're wondering, is Eddie Brock crazy? Is he actually talking to the suit, or is there no one there? And that's what I love the most about this story, is that you don't really feel like you get a definitive answer to that, although all the seeds that are you know planted here do get picked up later so there is some merit that there actually is something in Eddie's blood but we don't learn that for another couple years so in this one it has Eddie you know basically talking back and forth with the suit because he finds out that Aunt May and Mary Jane are at the hospital he's at and he feels like this is serendipitous in some way he feels like there's a reason for this because Eddie Brock is very religious he thinks there's a purpose and a reason why that of all people to be in the same hospital as him it's his greatest enemy's loved ones and the suit obviously is trying to talk him into killing Aunt May who is in a coma and maybe even get the jump on Mary Jane if he gets the chance to do that as well uh, but it's his last chance to hurt Spider-Man before he leaves this world because again he's still blaming Spider-Man for all the bad things that's happened to him. So that's really interesting. And that's one of the things I like most about this book too. Uh, there's a lot of things I like about these two issues, but this is definitely the redemption story for Eddie Brock, but it's also the one that shows you how broken this guy really is. And so of course he's battling that, talking back and forth between the suit that's inside of him. And then meanwhile, Peter goes and tracks down Madam Web and he sets up a seance and he says, look, I just want to talk to Aunt May's spirit one last time before she goes. And I want to apologize if this is the last time we get to see her, if she doesn't survive this coma if we have to pull the plug on her I want her to know that I feel bad for this and I want her I want some advice I need to hear her voice one last time is there any way you can do that and Madam Webb's like yes I can do this seance but you know one time so you know we don't have a lot of time let's do it so Peter gets you know Aunt May or not Aunt May but he has Aunt May there but he gets uh, Anna Watson who is uh, Mary Jane's aunt and neighbor to Aunt May you know her old friend and gets Mary Jane and the three of them are in a seance with Madam Webb and Madam Webb puts Peter Parker's spirit in touch with Aunt May and Aunt May just doesn't want to come back she says she's lived a good life but now she wants to go see Uncle Ben again she wants to go be with the man she loves and she wants Peter to be able to live his life without having to worry about her anymore uh, because she's always caught up in all the villain stuff and all the things that are going on and she's like I just go be happy with your wife grow old with your wife the way Ben grew old with me let me go but but he can't because as she's backing away from him he sees like this weird symbiote like thing grab her and pull her away and he realizes with a spider sense that she's in danger uh and so he's trying to get out of the seance so he can see what's happening in the real world to her and in the real world what's happening is that eddie brock is standing over her bed with the suit whispering in his ear over him begging him to kill her because before eddie brock came into the room he actually killed his nurse when he woke up in his bed and he saw like more blood has been taken from him and everything he was starting to get irritated with her and the suit is like look you need to sh i need to see that you have the spine to kill somebody so kill your nurse and it actually talks him into killing her and he slices her up like really really badly and uh, and and leaves her for dead on the floor and so other doctors and nurses find her and they're like well we got we got to find out who's responsible but they're already a little too late because he's now in Aunt May's room and he's standing over her and he's ready to kill her and Peter's trying to wake up out of the seance so he could possibly stop Eddie Brock and before Peter can wake up and get that chance Eddie Brock decides to stop himself for once and he realizes that it is time for him to take responsibility and that no matter what bad things Spider-Man has done to him there is no way he can justify taking the life 
of an innocent older woman who is in a coma right before his eyes. He's like, you know, the nurse, she's hurt me. She's treated me badly while I was at this, you know, hospital. Of course, that's his justification for it. We don't really know for sure if she did all that, but that's just, you know, we know she took a lot of blood. That's all we know. But uh, this is his justification. He's like, the nurse, that was one thing. He's like, I can't kill her. So he actually goes and stands by the window and waits for Peter Parker to come and stop him. So when Peter bursts into the room and says, hey, you know, Eddie, oh my God, Eddie Brock, what are you doing here? And Eddie says, yeah, I, I came to kill your aunt. And he goes, but I can't do it. She, she's a good person. And uh, and I, if she's going to leave this world, she needs to do it on her own. And it's not going to be by my hand. And he goes, and the reason I was able to stop myself from killing her is because I cut the monster out of me finally. And he holds up his arms. And on his arms, there are just cut marks all over. He cut himself up to bleed out and hoping that he would bleed out the last traces of the symbiote from his body finally. And uh, and in his weakened state, is like, and I need to, I need to say goodbye, Peter. He's like, I'm, I've done bad things. He's like, for sure. I've done a lot of bad things to you and to other people, but I am not a bad guy and I don't want to go out as a bad guy. I want to know that my soul was able to be saved at the last minute. I did not kill your aunt and I want you to know I'm sorry and I hope you forgive me for all the things I've done. And he steps back, goes out the window and takes a dive just like his aunt, you know, his wife Ann Wang did uh, a couple years earlier in the comics where she jumped out a window to kill herself. He was jumping out the window to go be with Anne or hopefully, you know, uh, fall into some kind of light uh, knowing that he did something not evil as his last act on Earth. But Peter Parker could not let him do that. Peter Parker is a good person and it doesn't matter how bad you are because Peter Parker will save you. So he does. He dives out the window, shoots his webs down and saves Eddie Brock's life. So at the end of this book, we have Peter Parker going off and, you know, trying to figure out what he's going to do with his Aunt May and Mary Jane. He's trying to find another safer hospital somewhere else to bring them to if he can even move, you know, Aunt May. And he's dealing with all that stuff. And meanwhile, Eddie Brock is in his room and he wakes up and he realizes that once again, he's alive. No matter what, he, the times he's tried to kill himself uh, the, and the time he just jumped out the window, obviously just now, and Peter saved him he realizes that uh, he's still stuck on this earth. And there's a moment here that I, I would say now in my personal life, if I can get personal for a moment, this is the story and the reason why I connect with Eddie Brock so much as a person who is broken. Uh, because as someone who has also attempted to take my own life, and as someone who also has this immense survivor's guilt from surviving a brain aneurysm rupture and then the suicide attempt, you get this thing that builds inside of you that just it makes you want to go like so badly. It makes you want to leave this place so badly. And to see Eddie Brock go through this and to reread this now that I am in a similar boat in my life, to reread the story, it was very cathartic for me. And it was, it was very much an eye opener to make you realize if you are going through something like this, this is a story may, maybe worth reading on some level because it, it, you can tell that Roberto was really channeling someone who was in pain and he really wanted to write Eddie Brock as someone who was in pain and seeing it like this and seeing Eddie trying to do the right thing it, it's, it's a really there's a really good message there and and it shows that it's not too late um, you know if you're out there and you're and you're hurting and you want to check out it's not too late to do something you know else to to go a different path and that's what eddie brock decides to do and that's the strength he builds up in the story is to choose a different path to go back to those words that j jonah jameson said to him when he was a 22 year old kid you know listening to him give that lecture and he says you know i'm gonna i'm gonna zig this time i'm not gonna zag i'm not gonna hurt this innocent person i'm gonna take that message that i heard all those years ago and i'm gonna finally listen i'm gonna accept responsibility for the bad i've done and i'm gonna do the right thing this time and there's something really powerful in that and i think roberto really captured that and made this more than just a two issue you know story about eddie brock you know running around like a crazy person there's some real heart and soul to this and there's salvation of a soul in the storyline and that's probably the most shining part of the story and the thing that stands out to me most definitely at this point in my life reading it, it it's it's just really 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 well done and so eddie is sitting in his room and he realizes that he's still alive and the suit is still there and it's talking to him again it says you know you were saved by peter he just can't let you go and uh, Eddie says, yeah, well, good. He goes, because it's time to turn things around. And I want you to know now, Suit, you know, you may still be in my blood. You may still be here. But I want you to know now I'm in control. And we aren't killing innocent people. And if we're going to stick around together, we're going to try to do something good. And that's where this story ends. It's 
Eddie Brock taken charge of his life again and he's going to battle cancer and he's going to fight this you know and he's not going to give up anymore and he's not going to you know feel let that pain take over and and you know push him to the point of wanting to leave when there's still enough of a human inside of him to do a lot of good in the world and we're going to find out some of that good coming up and it does actually tie back into aunt may and it does tie back into the theme of forgiveness and forgiving eddie brock so there's a lot of great comic book discussion videos we have coming up, but this is where we're going to end this one, this double creature feature, this salvation of Eddie Brock's soul from a really great writer. I think Roberto did a great job. And if you haven't checked out Riverdale, I highly recommend you do it. Roberto's awesome on that show. That show is really great. It's like a Twin Peaks version of Archie. I really like that show and I really like his writing. And ever since I met the guy, I've, I've been an even bigger fan of his. And he actually signed these two issues for me. The two issues I had, they're locked away, of course, somewhere in my closet. I was trying to dig through them before the episode so I could show him off, but he was nice enough to sign the copies for me, and uh, and I told him how much this book meant to me, post aneurysm, post suicide attempt, and uh, you know he's just a great guy. So if he's out there and he watches this, thank you for giving us this story, for saving Eddie Brock's life in the comics, but also saving his soul and putting him back on the path that we all as fans love him being on, which is the more righteous path. He's an anti-hero, sure, but there's a little bit more righteousness in him than a demon. So thank you guys so much for watching my episode. Let me know what you think of both these stories down below. Did you have a favorite moment? Do you have a different opinion than I have? Let me know. Let's discuss it down there. And before I go, I did promise you guys a little teaser of something I have coming up. I was hoping they would be here today so that I can actually show them off to you guys, uh, but I don't have them today. They'll probably come in sometime this week or next week. So as soon as they do, I will make the videos for you. There will be seven videos total because I have the six Marvel Legends Venom figures coming. I didn't think I was going to have the money, but luckily I sold my Xbox recently just because money was so tight and I had a little bit left over and I was able to pre-order these toys and pay off most of them and just owe a little bit left. Uh, I was able to do that at GameStop, which is really cool. So big shout out to GameStop for carrying action figures now and allowing you to pre-order them on their, you know, on their pay, you know, the website and stuff, but I was able to pre-order them there in the store. And so I didn't get them in time for them to ship right away. So they will get here as soon as they can. But once they come in, I will make a video on all six action figures. And the seventh video will be about the Build-A-Figure, the big monster Venom. So you will see those in the next two weeks and I will pump them out. I will record all of them in one day. And then every day I will upload one of those episodes to you guys so you can see these toys in all their glory. So again, thank you all for the immense support for 200 episodes, 200 episodes in seven months, and like seven months in one week, uh, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but to get this far this fast is so incredible and I owe you guys so much for that and also I do have another surprise for you guys but I'm going to hold that for right now because in case my health doesn't hold up and I can't go do it I don't want to promise something that I can't deliver on but there is something that I might do this week that you guys will be very into and very interested in and if I do it I will film it and I will share it with you guys pronto so look out for that thanks so much for watching my show as always like share subscribe all that fun stuff and I'll see you in the future peace